All right, guys. So I'm in way over my head. Uh, I'm discussing something that I really don't know enough about to sound very intelligent. At the same time, it's a significant enough issue in our generation and in our current day that I feel I at least need to dip my toe in the water. If you remember, I did a series, didn't expect it to be, I think it was four parts. It was called The Vaccine Dilemma. You guys remember that one? And uh, that was dangerous. Uh, I was entering territory that it's like, hey, buddy, if you're wise, you just stay out of that. And so if any of you want to see how I handled that, you can dig in the archives. There's some of my most listened to podcasts ever. You can just imagine. Anytime you dip your toe into stuff like this, you're just, unfortunately, it does get listened to. You know, you, you try and hide these things, but they, they end up going wild. Uh, however, this one is very different. It's, it's not really dividing the church the way the vaccine was, the way that uh, things like mask mandates were dividing the body back in the day where you had some people that are like, no, I need to, I'm going to show you love by staying six feet away from you. And then you have someone else that comes up and greets you with a holy kiss because they're being biblical. And you have this tension that just exists when we navigate forward into territory where the world around us is convulsing and it tries to play us as the body. And it tries to turn us against one another. And what we want to do is walk together. We want to be of one mind, one heart, one spirit as we navigate through these convulsive days where the, the enemy's up to no good and he's hatching schemes all over the place and we want to have our game on. But when the church becomes dull, we become dull spiritually, we become dull biblically, where we no longer are going to the text of scripture and to the spirit of God to understand how to reason. We're not seeking wisdom. We're defaulting to the way we've always done it. The challenge is things are changing around us, which force us to evaluate at a deeper level. And ironically, COVID-19, I wanted to call it COVID-20, but I didn't. I called it COVID-19. Isn't that weird? 2020, but it's COVID-19. That's, that's really strange. I'm sure I thought about it back then, but that just sounds weird coming out of my mouth right now. But that was one odd season. I don't know if you guys remember it. You guys, yeah. That was one strange season that I think the, the feel of it still exists in our world. Like it, it did a dampening type of effect to the body of Christ. In our aggressive evangelism, it became very difficult to speak through plexiglass and masks. You're like, brruh, 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 on one side, and they're like, oh, brruh, brruh, on the other side of the plexiglass, and it's like, you, you end up just giving up. It's like, okay, this isn't worth it. Maybe they can see the love of Jesus through my eyes from six feet away. And it's, it wasn't easy for us to know how to navigate, and that was, in a strange sense, I know this is going to sound like a weird phrase, but that was good for us. It was a dry run of recognizing when things change, how do we respond? Because for many of us, if we were to grade ourselves in how our Christianity demonstrated itself through our life in that time, many of us went into hiding. We put it under a bushel. We didn't actually become more aggressive. And yet throughout Christian history, when times become convulsive, the church rises up and is the solution. And I would say I'm not exactly certain that I could describe us as the great solution in 2020, 21, 22. I feel like we didn't do very well. Now, I'm not trying to be hard on us. I'm just saying I want us to get our game on. We have plenty of opportunity. I have a hunch in the upcoming years to do that. So this is just an exercise for us. It's, it's not necessarily a, you know, like for instance, I probably should give you my title since all of you are wondering where I'm going. Anyone who listens to the podcast gets the title up front so they know exactly what I'm talking about. You guys don't. The Ethics of AI. Don't you love that? This is a really difficult topic. And I am not going to give you an answer, which is classic Eric, you know, where I, I lay a whole bunch of thoughts out and say, I want us to reason together th with these things. But I want us to understand we are entering an age that is very different than any previous age, unless we go back to the very beginning, which I will, to a big monument known as Babel, uh, and where you see humanity beginning to rise up and see if they can reach that level of divinity, where they can be godlike. 
uh, it's very interesting some of the dynamics we're facing. Like I said, I could have, this could be a multi-year study where all I focus on is AI and all the possibilities of AI, all the ways that AI are being used. And I could have sounded so much more intelligent in delivering this because I'm really not an expert on AI. I don't know that much about AI. However, I do know that it is a very prevalent issue that we are facing. And one of the things I want to bring out is, is this a moral issue? Like is AI or the use of AI an immoral function of the human life? That would be very critical to know, right? Is it an ethical issue? By me utilizing AI, am I putting someone else out of a job, right? Am, am I now, you know, this artist over here no longer has a job because I'm doing all my art through AI? And that's an ethical issue. Is it an ethical issue? And so these are some of the things I just want to begin to bridge as the body of Christ. I want us to be thinking about this. Now, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up isn't because AI is the final issue for us all to decide on. It's that it's a practice issue for us because I want us to recognize that with a convulsive culture, we are facing issues and oftentimes we just take them and we just accept it because that's just the world we've grown up in. And I don't know if any of you are like me, but you wish you could just sort of sometimes live in a different period of history because it would solve certain issues. It's like I email for one. Email is great, right? But if you could give me a world without email and texting, I may be very interested in talking with you because it puts a pressure on my life communication wise, which I don't have enough time for. And so now they have AI solutions for answering emails. And I, that seems like a very funny solution to something that maybe we shouldn't have had in the first place, right? So we end up creating alternate versions of solving problems that we're creating for ourselves. This is the world we live in. It's a very fast paced, very messy world. And it's hard to find stillness. It's hard to find that, that space in life where you don't have noise because we live in a culture of noise. So the ethics of AI, this is again, just a practice run. I may end up with you know, uh, episode two or part two of this, part three, part four, because there'll be some feedback. People are like, you had no idea what you were talking about, Eric, which is that's what happened in the vaccine dilemma. I had a, quite a few people a little upset over my data and my facts. What's funny is in that first one that I gave, I said, that is the biggest problem with this is no one knows what's true. So, you know, if you talk with one person over here, they're going to tell you that we have, you know, these little robots, you know, functioning inside of us. Over here, you have someone that's saying this is the ultimate act of love to get the vaccine. That's how you love your neighbor. And so you have extremes one way or the other, and it's very difficult to say what's true about this. Same is true here. We have a lot of data, a lot of facts. We have a lot of stuff going on. So the replacement movement, I just made that term up. Uh, the humanity's great ambition. I don't know that that's the best way of describing it. But remember uh, Lucifer? Lucifer desired to raise up his throne uh, above God. He desired, he aspired for something that was godlike. And he didn't obviously think very highly of God and he thought he deserved the attention. For whatever reason, in the derangement known as sin that we have all entered into, we share in that weird behavior and that weird thought process where we want to take what God has given us and replace it with something that we deem superior. Now, what's interesting is what God has given us is the most superior version of anything that you could get. But for whatever reason, we want to reject the superior and we want to take an inferior and act like it's superior. And this is humanity in a nutshell. This is what we do all the time. Hey, you could have a savior. No, I don't want a savior. I want to be my own savior. You're going to be your own savior. You've got to be kidding. You actually think that you'd be a good savior. Sure. And you are choosing an inferior model in your rebellion against God. And for whatever reason, we're wired this way. And the only solution is humility. We have to humble ourselves and acknowledge we're wrong. Our perception is wrong. There is a way that seems right unto a man and it leads to death. 
So we need to acknowledge that. God, there's a way that I'm, I'm seen is right, but it leads to death. We need to humble ourselves and acknowledge that there is a way that is right unto God and it leads to life. And we need to say, God, I submit my mind to your mind. I submit my thoughts to your thoughts. Yours are higher than mine. And I choose yours above mine. And that is where salvation enters into the storyline. We choose him as a savior over ourselves or anything else. So the replacement movement. I'll give you some samples. A father. He's the perfect father. But some of us don't really want him as a father. So we'll switch that out for anyone that would love me. And you see that. I mean, that's the classic junior high, high school uh, thing. You know, the, the girl that was hurt by her father, you know, is looking and flirting around with any guy. Any, she's looking for something. But there is one source, and that's her father in heaven. Bridegroom for a one-night stand. Friend for the gang. Now, all the caps are on the left. This is Jesus. He's the father. He's the bridegroom. He's our ultimate friend, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's our healer. Ex exchange out that for experimental drugs. Shepherd for social pressure. Who's leading you? Who's giving you wisdom? Who's directing your life? Well, you have a shepherd. Or you could swap that out for the social pressure in your life. It's like, come on, everyone's doing it. You know, this is just classic humanity right here. But we do this. And we take something that is so superior and we trade it out for something that is so inferior. And we, of course, pay the penalty for it even in this life. It doesn't work. That doesn't save you. You understand your misery is stemming straight from this desire to be your own God, to live life in such a way where you don't need God. Have you ever had that where you know that God is your provider? Yeah, yeah, yeah but you don't really want to have to experience that. You know, I, I, I acknowledge it intellectually and theologically, but I don't want to be put in a position where I need to demonstrate it. I don't want to have to be in a needy spot where I need God to provide for me. And so we can intellectually understand this, but still we can default to an inferior version, which is to be self-sufficient, to have all we need. And believe me, if we were to go around and have all of you be honest, like some lie detector test, we, we set you up to it. Would you rather be dependent and needy and, you know, need God to come through for you every day, you know, for your daily bread? Or would you like to have all your daily bread, you know, delivered to your door every day and, you know, you're always taken care of and you never have lack? Well, I don't know that any of us in here is going to choose the dependent model. And yet God says it's superior. <laughs> Oh, what? I, that's not superior. Have you ever uh, struggled with the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. It's like, no, give, give me this year my yearly bread. Uh, so a daily bread? I don't want to have to be dependent in such a way. AI. So it stands for, for those of you that don't know, artificial intelligence. The word artificial should at least give something away right there. Because it is not the real thing. It is artificial. It is man-made. So Psalm 147.5, this is what it's artificially trying to reproduce. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. When you study AI, you begin to realize it is rather profound in what it's capable of doing and what it will be capable of doing. Now, I don't know if this is true. Some guy, it was just the guy cutting my hair. I was like, did you hear that the stock market, you know, uh, is, is up? And the so single reason is, is because the investment dollars going into AI right now. That was just the other day. And, you know, I don't know if that's true, but it does ring true. It's all these people in, on earth, like right now, most of us are concerned about it. But at the same time, if you knew that you could put your money into AI and it was going to go up because it's exploding right now, you might want to invest in this. And what are we investing in? What is going on here? So God is our great intelligence. He's not artificial. He's the real thing. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is mispar, is the Hebrew. Has no bounds. Has no limits. So the word infinite is a pretty good translation. Psalm 147.5. So the creator, now I put a C on that, a capital C on that, because 
and I, I say the great artist, capital A. You see, he is the creator. A lot of us are creative in here. You know, there's a lot of artists that linger around Ellerslie, and so there's a lot of creativity uh, here, but we're not capital C creators. We're not capital A artists. We are made in the image of the one who is the capital C and the capital A. And so he made us to be creative, and he made us to be artistic because that's the way he is. But we are not the capital C, nor are we the capital A artist. Genesis 1.1, I have a hunch you guys have heard this before. In the beginning, God created. It's like this first action that we see of God is that he is creating. Isn't that just a fascinating thing to link with him? That he is a creator from the very, very beginning. The creator creating thing, the creating through his creation. Now, this has always been a fascinating thought to me, that God is a creator, and so he could do all the creating for us, but he makes us little mini creators. And he wants to create through us. So he makes us creative, but he wants us to lean on him. And then he wants to create through us, which is very exciting to me being a creative sort of person. I really enjoy that thought that he could have made me just an automaton, you know, just sort of some robot. And he does all the creating and I just sort of bump into it. You know, and I don't have the pleasure of participating, but he has invited me into a relationship which is creative. And so each one of us is wired differently. I mean, I get excited about things like this. And so therefore, the way that I speak the ancient truth, which doesn't change, is unique. I have a unique voice. I have a unique manner. I have a unique illustration for this. We don't, if you came up and gave the same message, it would be very different than the way I would give it. And that's good. That's not a bad thing. And so people will nitpick the way Eric does things. Like, why does he do that? Why does he do that? Because I'm unusual. And I prefer that. I don't want to be like everyone else. There's a certain pattern in every field. There's like the model. And then everyone's like, I need to be like that. It's like Michael Jordan when he'd stick his tongue out, you know, and fly through the air and slam dunk it. Well, guess what I was doing when I was uh, young? My tongue was out as I was playing because that had to help me somehow. And I'm wearing his shoes, right? I want to be like him. Well, I should be inspired by him to play the game that Eric is uniquely designed to play. And unfortunately, I wasn't designed to play basketball like Michael Jordan was. So there were some limitations there. Exodus 35. So this is going to give us some insight into the artist, the creator, God, and how he works through his creation. So this is in the wilderness season when they are building the tabernacle. And Moses said to the children of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels for setting and carving wood and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. And he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him and Aholiab, the son of Ahasamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine linen of the weaver, those who do every work and those who design artistic works, and Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. Very inspiring scripture for me. Because I see that, for whatever reason, the artistic side of things usually gets claimed by the enemy. I, I don't know how that works. It's sort of like I teach a lot on the fact that we are sexual beings. And that's a territory in the church. Everyone's like, are you allowed to even talk about that? Well, I do talk about it a lot because it's critical for us to understand our makeup. God designed us this way. However, the enemy has taken it hostage as if it's his territory. No, no, he is not the creator. He takes what God has created and attempts to pervert it. And so our job as the believer is to take it back. Say, no, that's not yours. 
artistry is not the devil's territory, even though you look at Hollywood and it's sort of confusing for us. We're like, wait a minute, isn't that all the artists out there? Yeah, those are the artists that are working in league with a different agenda. But this is God's territory. And just because the enemy has taken it does not mean it is evil in and of itself. And so what we see is the spirit of God literally entering into artists to work through them to build this sanctuary. To, it's in the service of the sanctuary. I thought that was a very interesting thing, especially considering in the New Testament that the sanctuary or the temple is going to be us, and then that's as an individual, and then us as a corporate body. So, and what do we do? We reveal the unseen God. We reveal Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit comes into this sanctuary in order for us to do the service of it, through artistic means to reveal Jesus. See, that excites me. The Holy Spirit intends to fill a temple. The Holy Spirit is not looking for a goat. He's not looking for a chair. He's not looking for a clock. He's looking for a human. That's what he dwells in. Think about Jesus. He's the body of Christ. He took on our form. This is the form that the Holy Spirit intends to fill. He intended to fill Adam and Eve, but they rejected him. They sinned, and the Holy Spirit retracted himself. So Jesus comes as the last Adam, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives up his life in order to purchase us, to wash us, to cleanse us, so that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the agenda of God, is to live inside of us and through us. So the Holy Spirit intends to fill a temple. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know, says Paul, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own. The Holy Spirit intends to be revealed through a temple. So there are all sorts of different things that, like I could look at the Rocky Mountains and I could say, wow, I see God in and through that. And that is beautiful. God is revealed through his creation. There's no doubt about it. But the chief work of his creation is actually us. We are the closest resemblance to who he is. And so when we live in agreement with him, humbled, uh, surrendered, and given, we become the chief means through which the world will see and know. We are the chosen instrument to share the gospel with the nations. Acts 17, 29, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. You see, it's not man and his devising with what is gold, silver, or stone that is going to show the divine nature. It's actually a creation of God. We are that creation. The offspring of God, if you want to say it that way, the sons and daughters of the Most High, adopted in, in and through the work of the shed blood, we are the ones that are going to reveal the divine nature. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So this gospel that Paul is speaking about is going to be delivered in power. And that power is going to be of the Holy Spirit, which is dwelling in us. Now, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because there is a form of communication. There is a form of expression. There is a form of artistry that is very different that is being created in front of us right now. It is a burgeoning industry. And so what I want us as Christians to do, first and foremost, is to think biblically of what God's design is and to make sure we hold tightly to his purpose in a time of great intrigue. Because I, I'm a fascination, I have a fascination with technological development is very intriguing to me. I do have a laptop, right? And some of you could say, <gasps> but I do, uh, I do have a, smartphone. I, I do. And so you have to sort of question. It's like, Eric, are you walking uh, in the grace of God if you have those things? That's a good question. Are these immoral or are these uh, moral? I mean, to call a, a cell phone uh, moral uh, would be a weird statement, right? But to call it immoral 
is also somewhat of a weird statement. It's like, so you, except for some of those, those frequencies that come out of it, the radio, radio, uh, radio, radio, radiation. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. Radiation. Have you heard about that? Yeah. So there's like this stuff. You stick it near your head and you get some tumor in your brain. Yeah. So that could be immoral, right? However, I'm going to give you another word that would be very helpful in our thinking through this, and that is amoral, which means it isn't moral or immoral. The morality of something is defined by how you use it and why you use it. So technology in and of itself is actually God's idea. It's invention. It is taking the creative way that we were designed, taking raw materials around us that he created and utilizing them in creative fashion. That is actually meant to glorify God. However, if the how and the why get mixed up and messed up and they become sinful in their derangement, then you could take that same propensity and use it to harm. And of course, that brings us to where we're at now. This is part of the discussion. AI. So I'm going to make a bold statement here. AI or artificial intelligence is not something the Holy Spirit fills. He'll fill a human. He doesn't fill something artificial. He's not going to fill artificial intelligence. And I know some of you might get upset with that. It's like, well, why wouldn't he? He could if he wanted. And I'm saying he's made a pattern for how he does things. And you could say he's limited himself. Just sort of like when he became a baby, he limited himself. He humbled himself. He condescended to fill that form. And for whatever reason, our God, though he's God and he upholds all the universe, he also has a pattern that he will never violate. I remember asking uh, this one student who was one of the first semesters of Ellerslie. I said, do you believe God can lie? She said, well, sure, he could do whatever he wants. He said, that sounds so noble and so generous towards God that God could do whatever he wants, but he cannot violate his nature. God is, the, the revelation of who he was, what his name was, even to Moses in the burning bushes, I am. I am that I am, which means I was this way, I am this way, and I always will be this way. He's unchanging. So if he's truth, he can't be lie. So you could say, well, that sounds like somewhat of a limitation on God. He put it there, guys. God cannot be anything but who he is. He cannot suddenly turn evil because he's good. He cannot suddenly lie to you because he's truth. And that is part of the bedrock of our faith is we can rest upon the fact that God does not alter. And in that pattern of how he has designed things, he has chosen us as his means of delivering his Holy Spirit to house his Holy Spirit and to reveal the working of the Holy Spirit. Humanity is the choice. He did not choose animals. Animals are another choice. They're very reasonable. He didn't choose the mountains. The mountains would go, Rawr! you know, they could make some kind of noise out there. However, he chose us as the delivery vehicle. AI is not us. I know that's a, that's a confusing one. That's part of the, the challenge of this issue. It's like, well, it's sort of an extension of us. Yeah, but it's not us. Yeah, my oven could be an extension of an invention of us, but it's, it's not the revelatory device. AI, it is data, and the data could be correct and accurate. In other words, I'm not even making a statement that if you were to type something into chat GTP, chat GTP, is that right? Chat GTP, why does that sound funny all of a sudden coming out of my mouth? Did I get that right? GPT, okay. Chat GTP, it could give you an accurate GTP, GPT. Well, this is hard. You guys need to be up here. You know, this is hard. There's a lot of terms. I got a lot of A I G P T P T. Jippity. All right. So Jippity is my new memory technique for that. <laughs> you could type something into Chat Jippity, and it could give you an accurate answer. That doesn't mean that it's truth. Now, follow me on this. Facts and data are different than truth. Truth is a person. And so the revelation that we have is not just that we have accurate facts of what's in the Bible. It's that we live it with love. We live it out and it becomes personal. We reveal Jesus because we are people. And truth is meant to be housed in us and then come conveyed through us. 
And so nothing can replace that, is my simple statement there. So AI is able to supply us data. And the data could be correct and accurate, but it's not truth. Truth is always personal and is delivered through the vehicle of a human vessel. Revelation. So there's a lot of things that can be revealed and known. However, there's a difference between human revelation and divine revelation. So 2 Peter 1.21 is going to talk about divine revelation, which is where we're going to get the scriptures, which is the essence of what we are as emissaries of truth. We are divinely constructed. We are works of grace. We are works of a divine realm. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is going to move in men and women and then through them. And this is the means through which divine revelation takes place. This is something that AI cannot mimic, no matter what data you put into it. It cannot produce something because it is absent the power, and that is known as the Holy Spirit. The what if question. So there's all sorts of questions that come around this. I'm not even going to bring up many. I'm just going to bring up a couple, okay? The what if question. What if by using something of artificial intelligence, I put someone else out of work? This has actually been one of those things I've struggled with, I, you know, because in our world at, of Ellerslie, we have dealt with design a lot. We spend a lot of money on design. And you know that there's some really good design that you can get by typing in a sentence and, you know, paying 30 bucks a month and I can get some really good design here. Now, to be honest, you can't get the design that I can get with a human yet, but it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, you just need to take multiple steps if you want that sort of design. And maybe it costs more than $30 a month. I'm not sure. But it is very impressive what you can do through AI. And I'm not sure how many of you have seen it or been exposed to it, but wow is what you'd want to say. It's like, uh, that's, that's not human. That is like something I'm not even sure if a human could do. Oh, I'm sure they could. I'm sure they could. Wow, that's good. And that came back in a matter of seconds. It's very impressive and it's rather startling to the human side of us. But what I have a concern for, especially being an, a creative, I don't like it when chat GT, chat P, G, Jippity, can write a book, can make a movie. Now, my first instinct is to say it must be a rather stinky book, right? That, that's my first instinct because it's not human. And yet some of the things that they, that chat jippity, I'm going to just do that. That's my cheater's way of making it through this, are very eloquent, very stylish. They, they're, they have correct grammar. They spell everything right. And most of us struggle to mimic that. And that bothers me as a writer. Okay, do you follow me? And it, would I actually want to sponsor something that would replace what I am called to reach? I'm not called to reach AI. I'm called to reach humans. And so this becomes, this is where the ethics come in. And I don't have an easy answer for that. It's, I, what I'm saying is I want to bring it to the forefront for us as a church and to say, let's not just mow past that or move past it because the momentum is just there. I want us to weigh this as the church to say, what is our responsibility? So I have another, wait a minute, this is, oh, somehow I, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, this is the screen I, I was on, but I thought I was on the previous one. Sorry, guys. The previous one was this. What if something... What if by using something AI, I put someone else out of work? And then look at this one. I capitalized someone else. You see, as a creative, I have a tremendous need. Like as a pastor, as a writer, as a communicator, if you hang around me, you'll notice one thing I take very seriously, and that is I can't do this apart from God. That's my premise when I start. When I'm writing something or I'm preparing a sermon, I, I'm dependent. I'm like, God, I, I need serious help here because apart from you, I can't do this. So I have a need to depend. And it's actually one of my secret sauces right there, guys, is that I know I need my God. 
And then my God always comes through without exception. When you have a replacement system like this, and it really bothers me. I don't know if there's a, a, a pastor out there. I know that we have, I, I don't know what the name of the website is, but places that have like uh, sort of pre-digested sermons that are already there and a pastor will just go out and grab one. And if, I heard some statistics on that. I don't know who they came from. It came from someone in here. It might've been Philip, uh, since he knows that it's chat GPT instead of GTP. Uh, but that people, these pastors will just reach out and grab a sermon right? That is already like made by someone else or at least an outline for it. And to me, that is, that is a high crime. That is the opposite of what we are called to as ministers of the gospel is to take someone else's thoughts and act like they're ours. And so there's this challenge that I'm facing in this. Now, I don't know if, because I've never tried it, it to go to chat jippity and type in, make a sermon for me that says this, 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 and this. I don't know. I've never tried it. In fact, it bothers me to think of anyone trying that because some of you are going, well, we at least need to try it. And yet it bothers me because it's not the way the Holy Spirit works in and through his vessels. So if I was going to teach you anything, I would say, beware of replacing the someone else, not just the worker in the design fields or the worker in this field or this field, the medical fields, because there's all sorts of fields that are being threatened by AI right now. But the main someone that I want us to consider is the Holy Spirit. Are we replacing the Holy Spirit by turning to something that can generate rather fantastical ideas, but they're not generated from heaven? They're generated from something else which is not empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that is one of my key burdens. The momentum argument. What if I thought we should stop the development of AI? You ever had that? It's like, you know what? We should put brakes on this, guys. I don't feel comfortable with this. Well, it doesn't really matter what I say or believe on the subject. The wave of AI is greater than any one human opinion or even any group of 10 million humans gathered together to object. This is what I would call the momentum argument. It doesn't matter what we think. It's going to go on anyways. You ever had that where you just then give up? I don't want to lose our representation in this world known as the church. And so I'm not saying that the, my proposal is that we quash AI. That, that isn't necessarily my proposal, even though if you gave me a quick moment and you said, quash it or keep it, quash it is what I would say, just in a, in a moment. But that isn't necessarily mean it was a good decision. It's just my instinct is to feel threatened by this and to feel like it is encroaching upon dangerous territory. And I would rather just eliminate it. I would say the same thing with the internet. Eric, quash it or keep it? I could, we could quash it, quash it, get rid of the crazy thing. Man, there's so much evil that can come through that. At the same time, pause for a second. Technology itself is amoral. It is not the technology itself that is our problem. It's how and why. How are we using it? And why are we using it? You see, if those things were correct, you could utilize the internet to convey the gospel to the nations. You could. You see, there are certain sects of Christianity that have stopped their development in, like they, they stopped in technological development at a certain point in the 1800s. And they said, nothing beyond that. And so they're still where they were then because they believe that advancement and technology are evil in and of themselves. And I would say, I get it. I understand the thought process, but I would say it's a misappropriation of the word evil because I think evil can be done through those things and greater evil. You have a car, for instance, compared to a uh, you know, horse and buggy. And yes, I understand greater damage can happen through that car. I, I'm not gonna argue that. You could, you could really harm things through that car. And yet the car itself is not immoral. It is how you are using that car, why you are using that car, that actually defines the true health of that car in your life. The Hague Convention of 1899. So there's been multiple Hague Conventions. This is the very first one. It was called by the Russian Tsar Nicholas II. Nicholas II at the time was the most powerful ruler in the world. I, I, this is, he was r the Russian czar, which is another way of saying Caesar. So it was like a king. And 
Oh, uh, somewhere around 17 years later, he's going to be killed by his own people in the, uh, the, the revolution in Russia. And that's when Soviet uh, communism is going to come in. But he is going to notice something in the world and that is this advancement. Of course, we're just about to enter into the uh, 20th century here. It's 1899, right? And we're just about to have World War I in 1914. And we're going to have an explosion of technology. Explosion. And so this is going to be the industrial technological revolution. He senses this, that from the Civil War on through, you know, some of the, the Russian or the Prussian uh, Franco War, he's going to see this development of arms and the danger that we could destroy ourselves. And he is going to call for this Hague Convention. So all these nations of the earth are going to come together and he is going to make a pitch that we stop all forward advancement of technological and industrial development. Right here, we're fine. Now, it's interesting because when I hear that, especially knowing what's about to happen in World War I and World War II, I want to agree. And I want to say, I'm with him. I don't, we don't need all these advancements, do we? I mean, we're about to have the car, the plane. I mean, we have all sorts of things that are going to be coming out of this advancement period. And it's funny because most of us, aren't really that excited about thinking of giving up our cars and, you know, our ways of transport transportation. We can go around the world right now, right? And that's why it's tough. So this is a question for all of us. How would you have voted in 1899? If you had a chance to stop the industrial technological age, how would you vote? Now, what's funny is if you asked me, I'm going to stutter and st stammer around and I'm going to be like, well, you know, could we get on a different topic? Because instinctively, I want to stop something. I want to put a brake system on it. At the same time, I know how much potential there is for the gospel to surf upon the waves of these things. And it has. For instance, the fact that we can communicate, not just with one group of people, but we can record it, capture it, share it. I mean, am I going to say that's bad? That's not bad. But wow, this is hard, guys. At what point do you define it being bad? Well, it's, it's now. It's the AI thing. That's when it's bad. See, you follow me? This is hard. How do you draw a line? How do we define this? The ancient rise of superior intellect. So we're going to go back to Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So I would say, yeah, yeah, we're in sort of a time like that. Where those that are behind AI, I wouldn't say are healthy or are desirous of the glory of God. I believe they're trying to rise up into the heavens. And so I see that at the same time, it's, it's interesting because you have Alexander the Great and his desire to conquer the known world. And he wants to bring one language over the whole earth. This is the first time since Babel. And you know that God is going to take that Koine Greek that Alexander was toting, and he is going to use it to give us the greatest revelation ever known as the New Testament of Jesus Christ. We're going to see the gospel in and through that. Ah! In other words, what the enemy means for evil, God will turn for good. That does not mean we prosper evil as the church. It just means we don't fear what the enemy is doing. So, my accountant made a statement the other day and he said, my job will be obsolete in two years, maybe less. 
an accountant. I even asked the clarifying question, like creative solutions to uh, business models. Yeah. Yeah. AI will easily be able to handle that even better. Like even better than this guy? He's, he's really good. Yeah, even better. And that's an odd thing for me to know how to digest. I don't even like it. You know, you just sort of like to, you know, stick your head in the sand and act like you didn't hear that. This is also what he said. He, he had a whole thought process on it. So he says there are, you know, four, four levels of God's creation. There's God, you know, he's not created, but, you know, he's, he's at the top. Angels, and then third is humans, and then animals. And so then he said this. Another strata is being created that is able to think faster than stra that strata. It's supposed to be strata, three work better than strata three, and produce more amazing things than strata three. It possesses perfect self-control, perfect social correctness, and is much more pleasant to interact with than strata three. <laughs> Isn't that an odd thought? Now, I, I, you know, that, this is just one surmising, one thought, but it was fascinating enough to you know, have, have me think, okay, maybe we need to start addressing this as the church. But there, so soon there is, sorry, guys, that is just, poorly put together there on the screen. So soon there is number one, God, two angels, three, AI, four humans, and then five animals. In other words, we're being demoted to the level of animals because there's something superior that can get the job done and be so much more pleasant in doing it than us. And you, you can't argue that. I mean, it doesn't talk back to you. It just gives you what you need, right? And it thinks so much faster. It, is, it has self-control. You can program it to be socially and politically correct. It doesn't need to, you know, sound off at the mouth like Eric Ludi, right? You can put a cap on this. What a far superior version of life this is. Is this a real threat? So here's a, a few questions. Technology, is that the problem? Building or construction? I mean, because think about Babel. They have technology. They're utilizing their creativity to pull something off. Like you look at the, the pyramids. You look at, you know, Stonehenge. You look at some of these ancient uh, constructions. You're like, how did they even do that? Yeah. I mean, they had a, a, extraordinary intelligence back then to be able to pull things off. Is it technology that is the problem? Is it building and construction that's the problem? Is it invention that is the problem? And of course, I think I've answered that more than a few times. That isn't the problem. God invented those things. This is God's design. He, he has workmanship. He was even a carpenter, a builder, if you want to say it that way. Paul calls himself a master builder. In other words, we see that construction and building up a house is what God does. However, the how and the why is very, very important because the enemy always has a counterfeit. He wants to take what God has designed and he wants to sabotage it. He knows the significance of humanity. Have you ever noticed that humans themselves are the biggest enemies of humanity? You ever notice that? I mean, they love animals, but they hate humans. And they love their dogs and their cats, hate humans. I get it. I, believe me, I've been around a lot of humans. I understand how that can happen. But isn't it fascinating that even a lot of the things that we do in our politically correct age is to diminish humanity? It's like humanity is our problem. Well, aren't you one of them? It's like, yes, but I mean, we're the problem. We're the ones that are destroying the earth. We're, you know, littering here and doing this here, cutting down trees here. It's like we've forgotten the role that we have. The design of God is us through us. This is the chosen vessel. And that isn't to diminish all of his creation and say, oh, that's nothing. It's just to say that this is the pinnacle. He has chosen humanity through which to reveal his glory. I didn't come up with that, guys. He did. Our job is to submit and say, I have no idea why you picked me. <laughs> but wow, Lord. Okay, you're going to have to do it because I'm rather pathetic. He goes, yeah, I, know, I got that figured out. I submit that the threat is found in the why, I could say the how too, of behind the use of AI. In other words, what are you doing with this? Why are you using it? Humanitarianism. Now, now if you don't, don't read anything more on the screen, okay, guys, show some self-restraint here. I, I see some of you still taking peeks. If I were to say, are you a humanitarian? Most of you would say, absolutely, absolutely. I care a lot about humans. You don't want to be a humanitarian if you're a Christian. 
Okay, now I know what you think it means, okay? Because that's the vibe that we have in our culture. It means that you're taking good care of the things around you, people, you care about people, you're willing to do, you know, go to Africa and, you know, help the ills that are starving. That's humanitarian labor. However, you know what humanitarianism is? It's the belief that humankind can save itself outside of God. The doctrine that humankind may become perfect without divine aid. We can do this. We've got this handled. We don't need God. We can do it. And so it's the great lie of the ages. We cannot do it. That is the great truth of the ages. He alone can do it. Our dependence must be upon him. And anything that removes our dependence from him becomes a question mark to us. It's like, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Idolatry is elevating anything above God in your life. And so anything that would be elevated above the role of God, the role that God is supposed to have has to be questioned at least, has to be poked as like, wait a minute, do you belong there? And so when we elevate anything in our life and we begin to lean on it, we should question it first. There are things that I would say are completely amoral and they're not going to harm you because your use of them is healthy. For many of us, a car or a phone or a computer may not be our tripping spot. However, if it is, you should remove it from your life. If your computer is causing you to sin because you always default to going to the internet and looking at things you shouldn't, then you should not have that in your life. And that's the same with anything. Anything that ends up being elevated should be removed if it's creating a hindrance to your proper development. The motive difference. So there's a motive of the Babel builders versus the motive of the ark builder. God is going to show extraordinary creativity in and through the scriptures, even in and through his men. If you've ever been to the Ark Encounter, I think that's what it's called, uh, out in Kentucky, wow, that is a brilliant display of, I mean, we, we see what God gave Noah. It's like, here, here's the, the architectural design. And then what they present is that Mo, and Moses, then Noah had to then appropriate that with the help of God to have wisdom to know how to solve the myriad of problems that would have come with that. And I mean, it's, it is staggering. I've thought the same thing about Joseph. Joseph is very inspiring to me too, as far as his inventive side that seems to flow directly from the heavenlies in and through him. Like his solution for the seven years of plenty and the seven years of coming drought. It's like, uh, where did he, how did he learn that? He was just a punk kid. He got thrown into servitude and slavery, and then he's in prison. Where, how did he get this? He's even going to tell us. It comes from above. That's where he gets his wisdom. I don't want us to lose that. You see, the Babel builders got their wisdom from down here. The ark builders got it from up above. And what we want to make sure is that we're of the heritage and the lineage of those who maintain the relationship with the Holy Spirit, dependent upon the Holy Spirit, allowing him to cultivate our thoughts and our creativity and not leaning in an unhealthy way on anything that would displace that in our life. The motive of Babel, humanitarian. We don't need God. Look what we can do without him. The motive of Noah, for the glory of God. Let's obey our God. Let's demonstrate who our God is. Let's show off our God's greatness. My personal opinion about AI. Oh, I, why did I even put this up there? I think it is extremely intriguing. Okay, now you weren't expecting that. I do. I mean, it is so fascinating what can be done. It could even prove very helpful. And I'm not going to diminish that. There are certain things that you can use AI for that make total sense and actually would create greater health in people's lives. I'm not saying spiritual health. I'm saying greater health in people's lives. And it could help them with their health. It could help them with their daily flows. I'm not going to remove that. It, just like a car is a lot quicker way to get to the store than horse and carriage. And so, yeah, it would definitely help the movement, the flows of life. I am very concerned about it replacing human thought human mental rigor, human creative rigor, human contemplation, human reasoning, human exercise, human work. 
what I just named there are what we were built for by God. And I feel like, I don't know if it's the first time in history, but when I think about all these kids that could write their papers for school with chat jippity, that disturbs me at a very deep level because it's sort of like the calculator. When I was growing up, this is like a classic dad statement. When I was young, we couldn't use a calculator. Why? Because it would rob you from learning how to compute yourself. You remember those days? Some of you are like my age, like, yeah, we didn't have that. And now you can use your calculator. You can use your, just type it into chat, jippity. So you notice how I'm really taking advantage of that. You type it in, you have your answer. Who needs to understand how math works? All you need to do is allow something else to think for you. Now, granted, that's a really nice feature because you don't need to know how math works to be a strong Christian. Granted on that. You know, it's like classic dad, you know, thing who had to learn it when we were in school. You, you actually think someone has to know how to do that, has to know how to do that hard math. Otherwise, you're not going to have the character, Sonny. And I don't know if that's true. That it could be a dad thing, right? Just because we had to suffer through it, we want our kids to suffer through it too. I've been accused of that in my home in the schooling side. However, there is something about problem solving in your own mind which creates the ability to problem solve in life. And if you do not utilize that skill or that muscle, it will atrophy. And so that is what I'm concerned about. I am very concerned about it replacing human thought, human mental rigor, human creative rigor, human contemplation, human reasoning, human exercise, human work. When something else can do the work for you, why would you do it? So if something else could clean your home, if something else could make the meal, if someone, I mean, it's like the Jetsons, right? This is literally what it is. And when I remember watching the Jetsons going, that would be so nice. It's like, imagine your mom saying, you need to clean your room. You go, oh, and you push a button. And then the robot cleans it. It's like, oh, this is so hard. These chores that I have, I have to push a button. And granted, that sounds very nice. But what is it taking from us? I want to make sure that what God intended us to do in our life is not robbed. That's my main point that I want to remind us of as the church. American nervousness, the neurasthenic. So when I was going through my Teddy Roosevelt series, I brought up the neurasthenic. That was a term back in the 1800s, what we call stress now. But it was this. They had, it was a new phenomenon because there was this industrial movement and development where people were moving to cities and working in offices. Never before had they done that. And so it was creating this thinness of life, this unhealthy life, this stressed out life that they'd never seen before. And it's, the description is when one exercises the brain over their muscles. And ironically, I would think that that would be a great thing for modern America if we started exercising our brain again, right? But this was the problem back then. They no longer were exercising their muscles and it was creating an atrophy of life. So I'm going to call this American idiocy. And you could call it the dupe not the neurasthenic, when one exercises AI over the human brain. When you lean on this system, which is artificial and not filled with the Holy Spirit, to do your thinking for you, to be the creative agent in your life instead of your own mind, that's what I want us to be watchful of. I don't think it's evil in and of itself. I think it can replace a healthy processing that we as humans should have. How to decide what to do with AI. What is beneficial? Paul is going to say this. 1 Corinthians 6. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Isn't that an interesting statement? So imagine, because I'm going to use a different translation of this at the very end, and that is permissible, but not beneficial. And all things are permissible for me, but not all things are beneficial all things are permissible for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. As a believer, we do not submit to the power of a new technology. It does not mean the technology is evil, but it cannot control us. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and, for, and the Lord for the body. And God ra both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. 
Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality, a misuse of the body. And so what we are dealing with is, I'm describing one of my concerns is a misuse of the mental faculties of a human to misuse them so that they are being grafted in with something and being coming dependent on one, I could say one flesh, with something that is not of God. It's not actually ordained by God. It wasn't the purpose of God. So flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul the Apostle says it this way. This is our simple way of saying it. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And if I was going to give at least a starter package summary I would say, I'm not saying AI is evil or immoral. I think it's amoral, which means it doesn't in and of itself have a moral value. However, that does not mean those that are controlling it right now have a moral purpose. And therefore, at any point in time, with the coding of this, they can control it to say what they would want it to say instead of, what is true. Like I said, the data coming out of it now could be correct, but at any point in time, it can be steered. And I don't want our mind to become dependent on that. We are dependent upon the Holy Spirit and the word of God. That's what we know. And therefore we must reason constantly from that. So though it is permissible, it may not always be beneficial. So what is beneficial? So this is just a quick list to finish with. Is it beneficial to your relationship with God? It's a good question to always ask. If you find anything replacing your relationship with God, sort of the cheater's way to sort of, uh, you know, check a box, say, okay, God, I'm taking care of you. I I had my, you know, quick little uh, AI thing that quoted a scripture to me today as I was walking, you know, into the kitchen to get my protein drink. In other words, anything that is going to replace the diligence of pursuit I mean, if you're a miner and you're looking for gold and every day, poof, a piece of gold comes out and you just take that and, you know, it just set, sells it for you and you don't do anything other than just, I guess, wake up in the day, you're no longer vigorously, you're going to lo- lose the art of mining. You're not even going to know how it works anymore. You're not even going to understand why this is valuable. You're going to start to look at life in a deranged way. Is it beneficial to your relationship with God? Is it beneficial to your sharing of Jesus with the world? If you're utilizing something and it's increasing your capacity to effectively share, that's great. Like if it's easier for me to get to somewhere with my car than with my horse and carriage so that I can share the gospel, what you see is me surfing along the waves of technology to actually expand the kingdom of heaven. That's good. Is it beneficial to your marriage? Is it beneficial to your family? Is it beneficial to your dependency upon the Holy Spirit? Is it beneficial to the cultivation of your intelligence, your discipline, your work ethic, your creativity, your leadership, your overall life? There are certain qualities of the, of the Christian life that cannot just go by the wayside because things become easy does not mean we should always follow them. The fact that something could be done in a quicker way doesn't actually make it better. And that's part of where we need to keep our heads on spiritually. We need to remember to test everything against the word of God. And if it's asking us to compromise or to give up something that is an important quality in us as humanity to reveal the kingdom, then we need to say no to that. Even if it is permissible, it's not beneficial to what we are here on earth to do. Guys, that is not... a complete statement on the matter, I'm sure. And I'm sure that it's only awakened all sorts of thoughts like, well, has Eric even considered this? Probably not. I am not well-versed in AI. I couldn't even get my chat GPT thing down. It is not something that I oftentimes will utilize. I have utilized AI and I've been very fascinated by it uh, and very intrigued and very impressed, mind you, uh, to the point where I'm like shocked at how good things can be and how much better they are than if I was trying to do the same thing. 
which also bothers me, right? And yet I'm at that point where, like all of us, we are at a, a place where something is reaching a high enough level where we need to take notice of it and be aware. Because the way we interact with everything around us is ultimately going to impact our own soul and the world around us. We are the representatives of the kingdom of heaven on this earth. We have a responsibility to take these things seriously and to process through them. All right, let's pray. Father, we need your grace. We need your wisdom. We need you to lead us. Lord, we live in such a time as this. So give us wisdom for such a time as this, Lord. We crave it. We desire to reveal you. Lord, we love you. It's in the precious name we pray these things. Amen.